<laughs> so I can do this. All right, you're live. Okay, let's get started, huh? First of all, checking out my little clipboard here. Do we have anybody here for the first time? Oh, good. Stand up and introduce yourselves first, please. Take the microphone. We'll start over here. Uh, hello, my name's Jonathan McWilliams. I'm Whiskey 5 Alpha Juliet, Quebec. Uh, on my station's in Sandy and in my truck, but that's about it. Five land, huh? Texas? Yep. No, no, no. Here? Here. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm Canadian, if you want to be <coughs> accurate. We'll talk about that. I used to live in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Mark Hansen, KA7 CMH out of West Valley City. I was uh, a part of the group several years ago, and I thought, you know what? If you're going to get on the radio, you need to support the group, support the repeater. So that's what I want to do. Great. Thank you. Who else we got? Right here. Uh, K9 RPH Ferris, uh, Davis County, coming out of Centerville. So glad to be here. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Do we have any licensed upgrades? No? No license upgrades? You're all extras? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, what else? Um, we still don't have Morris, so we don't know about classes, right? I haven't seen him yet. Okay, uh, Mike, are you doing a class? Yeah, we're teaching a class. Give him a mic. Here. Mike needs a mic. Don't do that. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, um, James and I are uh, teaching a technician class. We're already four uh, classes into an eight-class um, um, uh, sessions, and um, James is also teaching a uh, general class uh, uh, for on uh, Tuesday evenings on a net. So uh, I'll let James uh, tell you about that. Anybody who wants to get into a class, um, we can either help you catch up on it. We're using the uh, Gordon West books, which um, Marvin introduced me to years and years ago. Um, and um, we'll help you uh, get caught up if um, you or somebody you know wants to get started. We have done a PowerPoint of every one of the uh, uh, 411 questions, so we can um, give you that information to study from as well. And James? KK7AVS, well, if you uh, know somebody that does need their uh, HAM license and they want to get their tech, uh, feel free to shoot me an email at kk7avs at gmail.com or mike ki7mti at uh, gmail.com and email, and we'll help you get in on the uh, technician classes. Uh, we meet up at uh, Make Salt Lake, and we actually do the class over Zoom as well, too, so we can figure out uh, whether you want to do it in person or over Zoom. But also, over the last few months, I've been trying out a little experiment um, I've been holding the K7XRD General Class Exam PrepNet. I actually do that every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Salt Lake Crossroads 2 meter repeater, 147.160 positive 600 kilohertz offset and a tone of 127.3 hertz. I'm there every Tuesday night at 7 trying to read uh, 38 questions of the uh, General Class Exam pool and trying to help you figure this out. And We've got a short amount of time before the uh, general class exam question pool changes, so hopefully we can squeeze in a few more uh, upgrades before the uh, pool changes. Um, I, yeah, July 1st. Thanks, James. Mike? Okay. We don't have any books today. Rick is ill. He uh, contacted us to see if anybody would want to fill in, but uh, apparently nobody came, nobody stepped forward. I'm Ron, K7RLS, and I'm currently teaching an extra class. It's at my house in Mill Creek. Uh, I've had two sessions, but only have one student. So I've got room for a couple more, and we could arrange some catch-up sessions 
to cover what we've already covered. So if anybody wants to uh, get your extra upgrade, if you don't have an extra, uh, contact me at my call sign, K7RLS at Comcast.net. I'm in the, uh, the club's direct, you know, membership directory on the rubber side. Thank you. It's very difficult to teach a class with only, with only one person in it. We've uh, done some work on our website, or I should say that uh, Clint has done some work on our website. I went through it and flagged some errors, gave the errors to him. He has corrected them. But I bring it up because I want to point out one particular page on the website, and that is the Elmer's page. I'd like every one of you to have a look at that. Uh, make note of any Elmer that might be able to help you, and more importantly, look at some of those blank lines. See if there's some place where you can fit yourself in there as one of our Elmers. We would appreciate it. Okay. Anything else before we go to our presentations today? Yeah, but it won't carry to the... Won't carry to online. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I want to, there are great efforts going on here to uh, get people upgraded, uh, mentor them and such, and uh, commend you for that. Also want to uh, put a plug in for VOTA. We had W1AW for a week in January and uh, had good participation there. Um, it's going to be uh, significantly more in, in June or July um, because we're in the beginning of the, of the cycle for 2023 when it comes to uh, VOTA doing W1AW. So when people become a little more uh, familiar with that and recognize what they can do in getting worked all states and other uh, awards, um, we're probably going to get a pretty good onslaught uh, in July. So keep open for that. But it's a great opportunity to include others who may not be involved much in ham radio or even HF or whatever. But, uh, you know, take it as an opportunity to do that. Um, you can go for points also. Some people are working for a worked all states. Uh, it's been a short lead time getting up to this, but that's going to make up for itself. And the other thing I want to point out is uh, there is something in the legislature about license plates. And it's possible that we may lose uh, all vanity plates, which is going to include ham radio. And if that happens, uh, well, it's just going to, you may want to get it now if you're, if you're interested in doing that. So, Keep that in mind, and we'll find out what the vote comes out. But it's not looking uh, favorable for uh, vanity plates. So we'll see what happens there. And uh, I think that's it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. One more announcement. There is a swap meet on the 25th in Farmington. So gather up all your junk, take it up there, and sell it and buy somebody else's junk. Uh, I want to put in a plug for Microvolt, so I don't have to write the whole thing each month. This would be good, and you would be uh, unhappy if I did. And in particular, if you're out doing something um, outdoors at a fair or a STEM event, take pictures. Uh, if if you see the mag, or I won't call it a magazine at, at eight pages, but if you see the thing. You're going to look at the pictures first and decide whether you read the article. If there's no pictures, uh, you're probably not going to read it. So take pictures. Exactly. And he's got 10 pages to fill up, so give him some information. Eight. Oh, eight now? Good. Okay. On to our presentations then. First of all, we're going to have Rick Graham, AI3W, do it, take our Elmer's Corner. He's going to talk about ham radio in challenging circumstances. Now, what comes to mind to me is uh, the bottom of the sunspot cycle, but I don't think that's what he's going to talk about. And then afterwards, uh, Rick Mead is going to uh, talk to us about ham radio and public service. Rick? <laughs> you were hiding.
Yeah, go ahead with the first slide. Introduce yourself. I'm Rick Graham, AI3W. Um, I have a three call because I grew up in Pennsylvania. I started out with KA3ESA as a novice. I worked my way up from novice to technician, to general, to advanced, to extra. I decided to go to a vanity call because I love CW so much. For those of you who know CW, AI3W, just type it out in your mind and you know why I picked that call. Okay, my presentation is uh, subtitled, when, you're, when Your Ham Radio Life Gives You Lemons. And boy, do I have a lot of lemons to share. Let's first of all, first of all talk about the American dream. It used to be that a married couple, two or more children, a pet dog, a suburban house, one or two cat uh, cars, and a yard with a white picket fence. That was the American dream. What about the ham radio operator's dream? Next. The ham radio operator's dream is one, a backup radio, um, probably a backup computer, probably another uh, amplifier here, uh, maybe one or two VHF radios, and to top it off, a nice antenna array with a 65 or 70 foot tower. That is the ham radio operator's dream. I wish I had that. I do not. Next. <laughs> My reality <laughs> is, and maybe some of yours also, is you live in a tiny, tiny, tiny little space, meaning 500 square feet, or you live in an apartment building, and this is your shack right there. <laughs> You're not going to get a tower up there. You're not going to get a 160 meter long wire up there. So what are you going to do? Next. So what can you do when you live in an apartment complex such as I do that has zero anything policy? And believe me, I tested that. They do not want anything outside. So everything has to be inside. Next. I tried stealth. But until they make a Bluetooth or wireless coax, it's not going to work for my situation. Next. I tried night mode, and that worked, but it requires diligence to tear down each night. And with it being 20-something uh, degrees every night, I'm not going to do that. And I got caught several times. Um, the landscapers decided to just mow over my coax, mow, mow over my... Uh, radials and things like that, and they reported me to the office, which gave me a stern warning. So therefore, no, nothing outside. Um, so wh wh what's, what's my other op option? Next. Should I move? I'd love to move, but with the economy nowadays, it's not going to happen. So I'm stuck where I am. Uh, next. And am I going to sell all my radios? It passed my mind from time to time because I'm just so dejected that I can't do anything. But the answer to that is next. No, next. No, 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 and no. I'm not going to sell my radios. <laughs> what am I going to do next? <laughs> next. So when you're hammering your life gives you lemons, my thing is make lemonade from it. Next. As long as you under, uh, next. As long as you understand the cold hard facts with uh, dealing with an apartment, you will not be a world class DX station. You will need to have lots and lots of patience. QRO high power and inside antennas equals bad RFI, not good. QRP and inside antennas is hard to be heard. Um, sideband and CW are going to be exponentially more challenging than digital modes. You may have to swallow your pride for digital because some people think, oh, digital, that's not ham radio. Well, it is. Uh, even so, running QRP inside antennas will make you a rabbit station. In other words, you can hear, but you can't work. <laughs> 
If I had heard all stations, I'd have my thousand countries by now. <laughs> Next. This is my shack. <laughs> it's a room 10 foot by 11 foot. My ham radio shack is here. My home office is here. And this is known as the abyss. This is where all my uh, packing stuff was because we were planning on moving back east. But things called COVID and things came into place. So we're stuck here until that happens again. So right here, my ham shack, you see my loop antenna. And here you see my JPO antenna. So I basically can run two 440 and uh, 10 through 40 meters at home. Next. This is looking in the outside of my outside of my shack. That's the window there. And right here, if you look real closely, you'll see where the screen was busted, where I stuck an antenna wire through or coax wire through. But um, as you can see, the lawnmower people love that area and they'll just mow anything in sight over. This is just looking down the other side there. Next. This is looking inside of there. So basically, this is the window here. And go next. It's eight foot from floor to ceiling. It's a 34 inch high window. And the floor to the bottom of the window from, from the floor to the bottom of the window is 43 inches. So my, and outside dirt is basically right where my cursor is right here, seven inches below the window. Next. So my office shack is 36 inches next below dirt. <laughs> next. This is kind of looking at my station there. This is my shack. Here's my loop antenna and my station set up there and a little bit closer with my ICOM 705 and uh, my digital stuff happening there. Next. I am making lemonade. <laughs> Next. To give you examples of what I've done, and I'm not trying to tout my own horn, but uh, this is all digital stuff. On 10 meters, uh, next, that's Japan. On 10 meters again, that is, next, that is um, Puerto Rico. And next, on 10 meters, that is New Zealand, all on 5 watts with an inside antenna. I am making lemonade. Uh, if you want to follow me over here real quick. So, this is my antenna. This is an Oscar Mike Zero Echo Tango MC20. It is uh, 7 through 30 megahertz. It'll do 20 watts max. And if those of you who don't know how to do a, a uh, magnetic loop antenna, you tune first for the maximum noise, and then you fine tune from there. And when I mean fine tune, one sixteenth of an inch of the knob can be anywhere from resonant at uh, one to five up to 40,000 to one. It's just that sensitive. This is my station here that I use. My 705, my, my uh, Surface Pro, and a LifePo 12 volt battery. Okay, this is my contacts to date with five watts in, in with my indoor antenna. Uh, you, all those little spots are a contact that I have made, not that I've been heard. That's what I have made. Uh, so I have 42 states, nine countries at 200 grids. Next. Once again, I'm making lemonade. Next. My whisper contacts. I decided to try whisper from home with that it, antenna. This next, next is 20 meters with one watt. That's who heard me. This, and I decided to be real adventurous. This is next. This is 40 meters with next 0.1 watts. One tenth of a watt. And I'm able to be heard all the way over to South Dakota, uh, that neck of the woods, and all the way up to Canada. 
As I said, I'm not going to be a world-class key X station, but I'm making trying to make lemonade. Next. Next. And again, this is, once again, just reiterate, this is my station that I'm making all those contacts with. No outside antennas, no anything. Next. So there's other alternatives that, uh, I, that it can be done, and this could be a future topic. We have parks on the air and worldwide flora and fauna, and just within this area, all these little dots you see are parks on the air. So uh, there's all kinds of parks. And for the adventurous people, the younger people, there's what they call soda, summits on the air. You climb mountains with your stuff and you make contacts. And all of these little spots here are summits that can be counted. Um, not for me. <laughs> Next. Next. There's other alternatives that I have um, to help me a little bit with my home antenna. I am actually using the Corinne remote site to hear for me as I transmit from my house. And with that, I've been able to, uh, just this morning, work Spain on 10 meters CW with five watts. Uh, I can't hear them with that, but I heard them great through Corinne. Next. There's also, and I wanted to tout this a little bit for an upcoming uh, session, uh, the UARC rem remote transceiver in Lemington. Uh, Gary, KK7DV, says there's uh, about 100 registered people for that, but only maybe a dozen people use it in a week. It's highly, highly underutilized. Next. Let me talk about parks on the air. I love parks on the air. This is my car. This is my Wolf River Coils antenna stuck on top of the car. And once again, that's my station that I just throw in the seat next to me. Next. Next. When I'm out doing parks on the air, I'm also a weekend bird photographer. All these pictures taken by me are uh, at parks on the air's locations. And in conclusion, don't give up. Next, explore other alternatives. Ask for help. There's plenty of help to be had. Give QRP a try. Have lots of patience. And when your ham radio life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Next. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> and as they say in QRP 72, which is the QRP way of saying 73 from AI3W. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. You'll need, you'll need the mic. I'll need a mic. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. I'm so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, for those of you that are old enough to remember. Uh, my name is Rick Mead, Whiskey 7 of Victor, Quebec. I'm going to start this with a quick story. August 30th, 2019, 3 a.m. in the morning, my phone rings. I recognize the number. It's Rob Hunter from the Emergency Preparedness Council in Bountiful City. I answer the phone. First thing he says is, are you available to help? I said, yes, what do you need? He says, we've opened up the EOC, there is a fire. This turned out to be the gun range fire in Bountiful. And so that was my first deployment for an actual emergency. What I wanted to do tonight was to talk a little bit about emergency communications and community service and a little bit about how I got to the point where I was on somebody's list to make a phone call to come and help. So first of all, a little bit about what I am doing these days. I am Utah Section Emergency Coordinator, also an Assistant Section Manager. 
I'm an official relay station uh, working with the 12th Region Net for traffic control. And um, I'm also have run a digital station. Um, I'm running BPQ32 and, and uh, VAR HF uh, pri primarily as my as my mode to be able to handle digital traffic. But I am currently passing traffic on CW, on digital, and on voice, all three mediums. Um, <clears throat> I'll get into a few other things that I'm doing when I get a little bit down the road. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to talk a little bit about ARIES, give a brief, brief background of that. Also, what options you have to provide communication support. My experiences, and that's really where I wanted to focus, because when I was asked to do this presentation, I know a lot of MCOM presentations go through incident command structure, national incident management system. I have done those. They are worthwhile, but a lot of people that are wanting to get involved in emergency communications to help their communities really would like to understand how it is that they can actually start the process and get involved. And then we'll talk a little bit about training and then who you can contact uh, once you decide you want to uh, take a few uh, deeper steps into, into this program. Go ahead and switch. So being an effective emergency communications you need to know the framework you're operating within. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in, in the next slide. You have to develop both technical and operational skills. One of the things that I have found in a lot of the ARIES groups that are around in the state, they have nets on a regular basis. People actually are acting as a net control station in those nets. But what they are learning is really how to manage what I would call a tactical net. They're not doing as much as they could do in order to gain expertise in handling a resource net, a liaison net, a traffic net, because those require different skills for the net control station to be able to actually monitor that. <clears throat> you have to have a plan. This is something that I'm working on as far as putting together a statewide emergency communication plan, and then being able to try to tie together the various counties and make their plans align with that. And that, we're not going to get into a lot of detail tonight, but I'd be glad to talk about that after the fact. <clears throat> then you need to practice the plan. Actually do what the plan says. Assess the effectiveness of both the plan and your own abilities, and then to improve. Now, I know a lot of folks that uh, when they first get their license, they spend their time in their ham shack, they're checking in on a weekly basis while they're indoors. What I would encourage you to do is experiment with going outside, deploying yourself, just using your own go, ba go bag or just your mobile rig that you may have in your vehicle, whatever that happens to be. Go to the next slide, please. So, Today's communication infrastructure can fail or become overloaded. This is a statement. I'm not going to read it. You can read it on the screen. But this is, was stated in the EC16 course, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in training. The bottom line for this is that if the real thing occurs, you are going to find that a lot of the infrastructure runs out of capacity. There was an ARIES document or an ARIES letter that the ARRL put out last year where they were reporting on a on a presentation done by Craig Fugit, who was a previous FEMA uh, administrator uh, for two terms. And he is a big believer in simplex and HF, because anything that you are using that requires infrastructure, there is a chance, a good chance, that it will not operate the way you want it to in an emergency. And that includes just as something, just like a repeater. And I know we had some repeaters that took the, took the uh, inner tie down. Um, and if we were depending on those for an emergency communication session, that would have not been working for a few days, um, here recently. But that's just something to keep in mind. So what you need to do is test both your simplex and be thinking about HF. HF will work well in, in a lot of communications. We use it all the time to handle traffic within Utah. Next slide, please. So possible structures that you might be working in. You could be 
participating in a service net such as Saturn. One of the things, and I check in on this on a regular basis during hurricane season, there is a Saturn net, a hurricane watch net, that runs off the East Coast, uh, and it basically handles uh, the entire country. But what they're looking to do is being able to handle wellness traffic for those people that are evacuating from the East Coast. When cell towers are overloaded, they can't even get an SMS text message out. They can get with the Salvation Army or the Red Cross, they do something similar, and they can put wellness traffic out on the net. I can pick it up here in Utah, and I can drop it into the 12th net and get it any place in the western United States that I need to uh, in order to help them out. And those would be messages simply letting family and friends know that they are okay, they are evacuating to Aunt Helen's house in Tennessee or wherever it happens to be, and be able to get that information out to them and let them know that they're okay. Or if they need help, they can provide that in, that in those messages as well. The other thing is to volunteer directly with a group such as the American Red Cross. Um, there are a number, and we'll look at this in just a minute for the no total number of organizations, but you've got the ability to volunteer with any of those groups and help out in case of an emergency. The American Red Cross has got its own communication support. They bring out trailers when they have to, depending on what the event is. And they are also highly involved in wellness traffic as well. As a matter of fact, many times, ARIES groups that are local that provide augmented help for those communications, that's what they're doing is when American Red Cross gets overloaded, they can handle additional traffic on behalf of that uh, wellness traffic going through. And then you've got to uh, be part of the Amer an Amer amateur radio support group. And I'll draw a distinction between that and ARIES. Both of them are valuable. Uh, an amateur radio support group is not necessarily an ARIES or an amateur radio emergency services affiliated group, but they are working with a provider, could be a sheriff's department, could be a hospital, could be um, a food pantry, could be anything, uh, in order to help provide communications and be able to um, work, work uh, or, or provide service to the community. And then also amateur radio emergency services. Now, amateur radio emergency services, please go to the next slide. That was actually struck or went into, uh, was formed in 1935, and it is part of the American Radio Relay League. Um, the important thing that this message is about is in 2019, the ARRL published a strategy document talking about ARIES and what it was intended to do. That strategy document introduced a couple of things. One was training. That is where the ARIES task book was first brought into existence. Um, <clears throat> through that, uh, what they're doing is, is aligning with a lot of the other organizations that are out there in order to provide training to their volunteers so that they have got a consistent known quantity that they are able to apply to any emergency. Um, and so, and so that's, that's what, that's what this statement is, is about. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a list of all of the memorandums of understanding that the American Radio Relay League has with various organizations. All of these organizations, whether it is Citizen Corps, Association of Public Safety, Communications Official International, and so forth and so on. You can volunteer for many of those organizations. The American Red Cross is up there. Salvation Army Network is, is part of that as well. But these MOUs are not intended to be prescriptive about what kind of help is provided by amateur radio. What they are is an acknowledgement that the two organizations, ARIES or the American Radio Relay League, however you want to look at that, and that organization, there is a symbiosis that can be created between those two in order to provide support. And that's what this is intended to provide. Please go to the next slide. So my experiences, <clears throat> and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time, and, and this is where I want to focus on how I kind of got to where I am now. Back probably six years ago, I decided I wanted to take a community emergency response team training course, which I did. I was very interested in that, saw a lot of value in it, and during that process, I started to build 
relationships. You're going to hear me talk a lot about relationships as I talk through the points on this slide. The next thing I did after talking with some of the people there and being encouraged to do this, I took the train the trainer course offered by FEMA. And so I started training CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. This is where I got the relationship built to where I got that phone call back in 2019 to come help. It wasn't because of my amateur radio expertise per se, it was because I was involved with the community doing these other items or these other activities as well. And building relationships is key to that. Other things that I do to build relationships, I am part of the volunteer examiner program. I am also, in addition to training for CERT, uh, an emergency block captain. And I talk to my neighbors about emergency preparedness and do a lot of work with that in order to help them improve what their ability is in order to, to bring that up. Um, I encourage people to get onto traffic nets. As part of that, I encourage them to learn CW. And I know there's a lot of people that are not interested in that. I personally find it a lot of fun. When I got back into this hobby, and I'll give you a little bit of background for me when we go through this. I was originally licensed when I was in high school in 1966. Had the wonderful experience once I got my general to be able to operate K7KIR at Olympus High School here locally and run their Collins S line. And I'd go there Saturday mornings and I actually was able to get King Hussein and Jordan in their logbook working DX from that uh, back in the, the day. And fortunately, I got my license at the peak of Sunspot, Sunspot Cycle 19. So that was, that was very, very cool and very fortuitous. But I then went into radio school in the military, joined the 19th Special Forces here. And quick story, many of you may know Dave Williams, WA7GIE. Uh, he's done a lot of work on the repeaters here in the state. And um, it turns out I met him on the plane. He also was in the Special Forces when we were going back to basic. I got talking with him, and it finally occurred to me and to him both that once I had built my DX60A and my HR10 Heath kit transmitter and receiver when I got my novice class, he was my very first CW contact when I had my novice class, and he was living up in Colville, and I was living in Holiday at the time. So that was, you, you talk about small worlds, it doesn't get any smaller than that. Um, but continue to build your skills. After I got through through that and when I was getting ready to uh, wanting to help with uh, with traffic systems here and get my CW speed back up again, I went through the CW Academy, which is offered by CW Ops. And once I got my speed up there, became a member of CW Ops, I'm also an advisor to help other people learn CW. I love doing that. So. Every time you make an inroad to help somebody else, you talk about Elmer Corners, uh, you talk about the Elmers that you're looking for um, in the club, every time you reach out, put your arm around somebody and help them out, you're building a relationship and you are enabling yourself to be more effective in providing support to that community. Anything you can do like that will not necessarily directly get you involved or get you um, uh, into a position where you can help but it will pay dividends down the road because you will simply become known. Participate in other activities, whether it is a parade, whether it is field day, whether it is winter field day. I was out by myself because other people decided the weather was going to get too cold. And so I was out on Antelope Island last weekend, no, yeah, a weekend ago, week and a half ago, at winter field day, put up my own uh, antenna, running my rig out of my trailer. I went mobile. I didn't go outside this year. Um, but I did that just because it's fun to do, and I wanted to lead that as an example. I like taking my radios out in the field and setting them up, a lot like Poda and Soda that was uh, discussed here earlier. Um, and continue your training because you're, I tell people when they get, when they pass their tests, when we're doing volunteer exams, I say, you've got your license. That's really a license to learn and start exploring other things, whether it's FT8, whether it's digital, whether it's, it's, it's RTTY, whether it's CW, whether it's QRP, doesn't matter. Just get out there, try things, build your own antennas, have some fun. So that's how I built relationships, and that's how I got myself to the point where 
somebody who's sitting in the back of the room asked me to be the Utah Section Emergency Coordinator. And some, so, so, so there's upsides and downsides to this. <laughs> um, please go to the next slide. So you've got, to, you've got to develop both your technical and operational skills. So learn how to operate your equipment as well as the equipment of the agencies or the ham organization that you have. Um, I know a lot of ham groups try to um, keep the same radios. Um, I have got a mix of Kenwood and ICOM that I use personally, but I've also got some Yesu radios as well. Um, and and so that's typically what what I'm what I'm running are those those three. And that helps me if I'm helping somebody else with their radio because I'm at least familiar with how to navigate and be able to set things up. Have raw materials for constructing antennas in the field. It was interesting in the same presentation that uh, Craig Fugit was doing, he made that observation that the most fragile and the most damaged piece of equipment that you have anytime you're operating out is an antenna. Those things will have trees fall on them, they'll have wind blow them down, they'll have a lot of things go wrong with them. And so you want to be able to build a new one, repair your old one, whatever it takes in order to stay on the air. Consider having the ability to connect anything to anything. And by that, I mean connectors that will take a PL239 and put it onto something else that you may need in order to connect an antenna. To have, uh, to be able to uh, even have a, a, um, a soldering gun that will work out off of low power or if you don't have a soldering gun, keep a Benson burner handy to where you can at least heat some solder in order to make a connection should you need to do that. Um, participate in nets, not just the, your local net, but I would encourage you to participate in traffic nets. That's how I actually got involved into, uh, as an official relay station, I was handling a lot of traffic on the Beehive net, which meets at uh, 1230 every day on uh, 72, 72 kilohertz. And they had somebody who was acting as a, as a liaison station that had passed away, was a silent key. So I was talking with Jim Brown, and I said, I will be glad to help you with that liaison. He said, thank you for that offer. And so I simply took it upon myself to start checking in to the uh, to TWN net, the 12th net, at night on CW. And literally, the first night I checked in, I picked up a piece of traffic. And they were so excited by that, I'm now handling between one and 200 pieces of traffic a month between CW, voice, and digital. Um, when Bill Moyes, N7IE, um, had to take a leave because of some medical things that were going on with him last year. Um, I actually stepped up and was handling more traffic on the CW side and started bringing in a lot more traffic into the Beehive net and was actually passing some of their net control from the various transcontinental core stations and so forth on a regular basis while he was out. He's back now, but we're sharing the load a little bit more equally than before he left. And uh, and it is a lot of fun. And I'll tell you, there's a, there's a lot of standard messages. Kate Hutton, K6HTN, sends one on a regular basis, which basically says, greetings by amateur radio. Congrats on your new amateur radio license. Please ask Delivering Ham for more information about this message. That's the message she sends out to a lot of new hams. It's fun to make that phone call locally and pass that on and talk to those new hams to encourage them and give them your name if they have any questions about something that they're trying to do that you can help them with. I hope I'm not running over time, Marv. Are we still good? Okay. <clears throat> Participate in contests. It's a lot of fun. It teaches you how to do things on a recurring basis. It helps you keep a log. Logs were a much bigger deal when I first got my license in 1966 than they are today. I mean, if I was on a, on a traffic net uh, in 1966, I would be logging down every contact that I had. Today, not so much, but I do put all, all my other contacts in my log um, that I'm using and upload everything both to uh, Club Log and to uh, uh, QRZ. Um, <clears throat> operate portable. Go out and have some fun with that. I frequently... Well, every time I take my trailer out someplace with my wife, I find some time to get my antenna up. I've got a, a an NFED that I that I run. It's got a transformer that I built myself, uh, making contacts on that up in in um, in Idaho, out in the wilderness, is just a lot of fun. So operate portable. Build yourself a to-go box, and if you are checking into an Aries net on a regular basis, 
Deploy yourself sometimes. Go to a parking lot. Go up to a park. Go out west of wherever you live. Uh, go out to the desert. See if you can reach then. Experiment when you go out and are operating portable with how far you can reach, both with your portable radios that you've got in your truck and also with your handheld. And just see how far you can actually prop, how, you, how far your, your signal actually gets out and gets away. Um, as I said, build a go box. Please go to the next slide. <clears throat> Operational skills, can, we're going to continue this. NCS operation for various types of nets. I mentioned that before, but uh, traffic nets are different. I actually designed an exercise last year for the Davis County Aries Group, which was about sending messages. And so I had a net control station set up, had stations monitoring both that station and two simplex um, frequencies that we'd identified. And so the net control operator was getting traffic coming in that was destined from one station to another, would assign that to one of those simplex frequencies. So those people would have to go over, pass that traffic, and that traffic actually caused something to be generated and a request being made to send the result to another station. Then they would have to go check back into the main net, confirm that they'd pass the traffic, and then would have to go back out potentially to another frequency in order to pass the traffic the other side. It gives the net control operator the ability to track all of those various things that are going on and remember what messages were sent and be able to confirm how much was actually done during that test. It's a different skill set than a tactical net. Um, <clears throat> traffic handling. Whether it's an ICS-213 or a radiogram form, and I know that there's some work right now to try to bring those two together. I know that's been talked about forever. Whether that actually ever happens or not, I'll, I'll, I'll wonder. I probably won't live to see it. But um, it's something that's, that's going on. But then, um, but practicing sending those messages is important because you learn the formats, you learn how to pass messages accurately, and and be able to speak at a pace that the person receiving the message can actually copy and understand. Um, get into various digital modes. Winlink, D-Star, uh, narrowband emergency messaging system, which is based off of FL Digi. That is really handy because I, I've actually experimented with that using my handheld. If I'm actually, if I'm running that software on a laptop, I can acoustically couple my handheld to that and send a message to somebody else. Uh, which is which could include sending a file or a digital form, and they've got all of the ICS forms out there on that uh, NBeams uh, software. You can you can pick that up. JS8 Call is a really interesting HF uh, mode that gives you keyboard to keyboard capability. You'll see that for other stations that are on, assuming that they're set up. That was one that I actually was was working on, and I was going to take over to Lake, uh, to Lake Tahoe to do their their 100 mile run last year that got canceled because of the fire. But in experimenting with that, it, it's it's great experience to use the F layer as your repeater because you can set up an NBIS antenna on HF and use that to use that JSA call. And it's a very solid, very dependable communication medium. And whatever digital modes are used by your groups in which you participate. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, spend some time taking a look at that. Next slide, please. Quickly, this is the uh, ARIES task book. Basically, to get to level one, all you've got to do is print the task book out, get a license, and join an ARIES group. At that point, you're a level one on the ARIES task book. Go to the next slide. That doesn't really get you ready to actually go anyplace. Um, on the next slide, this is getting into a little bit more detail. By the time you get through all of this and get to level three, which I have done, you will have taken EC001, EC16, which are both offered by the American Radio Relay League. I, I will tell you that both of those courses I find were excellent. I refer back to those materials on a regular basis. And by the time you get through that, you'll have also completed the personal development series within the FEMA course structure because that's required to get the EC16. Please go to the next slide. This is just more detail. This is the ICS courses that you'll end up taking as part of getting to, to getting to the uh, um, EC16 or getting to level three. Um, Oxcom is an optional one. Oxcom is an interesting thing because 
depending on who you talk to, they either like it or they don't like it. Um, and there are a lot of states that are doing different things in order to actually get the people um, certified that they want to be able to use for their state emergency communications. If you look at the state of Utah right now, uh, and talking with Scott Saunders, his view of the world is that use the Aries group to do local emergency support communications. And, and remember, we're not replacing anybody's communications. We are augmenting it. Um, and then if you want to do something more than that, they are working actually on, on uh, putting together their certification that they want to use for the state of Utah through the Diversion of, er, er, Division of Emergency Management. And that's going to be using something called UCOMP, which is something that they're, that they're in the process of setting up now. It's not well established yet, but they're working to put that together. And there will be opportunities to be able to step up in that. One of the things that is interesting in the EC16 is it actually talks about some people want to volunteer for a position within an Aries group or others, and they might not be suited for it. And by that, I mean suited by temperament. They don't hold their temper well. There are a few people like that. You may have run into them on the air from time to time. Um, and in some cases, those people are really not well suited to help in an emergency. They're not the right ones. One of the other courses that I took, which was um, managing spontaneous volunteers, that's part of what they actually talk about in that course that is offered by FEMA. And that is you have to go through a vetting process. Um, for example, if you were putting together volunteers for uh, searching for a lost, lost child, there are some people showing up to that for all the wrong reasons. And so you actually have the police involved to do a quick vetting of individuals that are volunteering to make sure that they are they are there for the right reasons to help and not for the wrong reasons in a case like that. Please go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> down here, you'll also get into proficiencies and skills um, and operating digital modes. Uh, program your, your, your HT, and that's kind of what we were talking about, about learning how to, how to operate your radio. Next slide, please. So in closing, I would suggest that you carefully read the ARIES Strategic Plan and the ARIES Manual. You can find those out online. Um, Commit to completing EC16 course. It's incredibly valuable. I, I, as I've said before, I refer to back to that on a regular basis, along with the other FEMA courses. Commit to completing the ARIES task book and think more about HF. It's a lot of fun. Um, I'd love to see that we're getting people helping to find, get people get up into their extra class, uh, because that opens up, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, fun DX parts of the band and uh, and some other things that can be done there. I'm, I'm going to be trying to chase Bouvet when I get done here later tonight as well to see if I can finally listen to them. But um, next slide. If you are looking for somebody, uh, there, here are some other resources for the Aries Manual Strategic Plan and the task book. Um, and I'll leave this. Are you going to put this out on a website um, if you've got that? Okay. Next slide then. Um, you can contact me, W7VQ. If you're in Salt Lake County and you're interested in getting in Aries and you're not, you can contact Russ Harmon. If you need his contact information, let me know. If you're over in Tooele County, go talk to Ronald Smith. He's the EC there and he can help you out there. Up in Data County, Davis County, Ferris, and I know you already know this, all you got to do is talk to Mike Groves and he can help you with that. And down in Utah County, we've got a new EC switch places with Michael Presses and that's, uh, Karen, um, Alcorn. Um, so, uh, and she's doing a, a great job getting her arms around, uh, the EC job down there. If you need to find an EC in another county that I haven't just talked about, or if you need their contact information, let me know. Mine's easy to find, w7vq at arrl.net. It will get to me and I will get back with you. And with that, I would like to open it up for any questions that you might have of something I didn't cover that you were wondering about. Believe me, I didn't talk about it all. Yes. Excuse me. I am the um, emergency preparedness coordinator for my LDS war. Okay. What would you suggest I do to help my ward prepare for an emergency? Repeat the question. Pardon? Repeat the question. Oh. He's the emergency coordinator for his LDS church ward, and he wants to know what he should do in order to help his members get prepared for an emergency. 
Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is to get everybody through a CERT class. That's one of the best things you can you can do. That's something that I'm still working on because I'm also a block captain uh, in in my area. And uh, even though I'm not a member, I'm actually the ward coordinator <laughs> because they decided that I've been doing this enough that that I should uh, I should take on that role. Uh, so that's the first thing that I'm trying to do. The second thing is to actually think about the actual emergencies that you're going to have. And this this is actually leads it's a great question because um, I was having a conversation with uh, with Jeff Ryan, who is the Rocky Mountain Division uh, director. Uh, he got his emergency training in Colorado. That was where he cut his teeth on on his emergency communication. And he said, I made this statement after a, uh, a meeting that he was in, which is responses to emergency don't happen as planned. They happen as practiced. And that is key because because what you practice is what you're actually going to do in an emergency. And I'll give you an example. Just in my block, going back to the earthquake that we had here in Magna, we had had a great Utah shakeout the previous year. Everybody dutifully put their door hangers out saying, I'm okay, um, when we went through that exercise. When that earthquake happened in Magna, I felt it at my house. I canvassed my neighborhood. When I went through that, and looked at every door that I had was supposed to be supposed to have a hanger on it says I'm okay or I'm not okay. There was not one. And it's because they practice it sort of once a year and then they forget about it after that. You can't do something once a year and have it stick. You got to do it more often than that. And so the other thing I would tell you is to work with those people that are your, your various block captains and so forth and actually work through some other drills. Now I know the effect that what the what they do with the Great Utah Shakeout in a lot of areas is simply use that as a way to test the communication of their program or the fact that, that information is getting out. But I will tell you that in um, and and one of the, the other thing that I'm doing is is because I started training certain doing other things I'm actually on the Bountiful City Emergency Preparedness Council now as well. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we do a drill every other week uh, and we test our emergency plans and we make adjustments to them we learn from them and we are constantly tweaking and making updates to them that's the other thing i would suggest that you do is to actually do some some tabletop desktop drilled exercises and if you take those ics courses there's some great information on there about how to put together a program or an exercise and spend the time to actually walk through those for a fire. I mean, you saw the one in Colorado last year that, that took out that entire community. Um, we have fires out here all the time. Those things can jump around in the winds that we've got. You've got severe winter storms that you, you can, you can test. You've got floods that you can test. All of those things are going to happen. Wind storms. That was the other thing I got deployed on is one of the wind events. I live in that, that chunk there between, I live in North Salt Lake and going up towards uh, Centerville, Farmington area up there. Um, they get nailed by by heavy winds frequently, those downslope winds. Um, and and what our, our radio communication was doing for that particular one was not necessarily dealing with the wind as it happened, but once it got done, we were on the air for a week handling the cleanup and coordinating truck movements in and out of uh, various parking lots where refuse was being dropped and taking that out. That get to your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. The city has restarted in certain first classes in, in Salt Lake City. So that and in West Valley. Okay. Pat. Part, <laughs> Pat was just telling me that he's glad that he put me in this role. So <laughs> Other questions that I can help with. Again, what I'm trying to do is, is take this down and make this as real for where you want to get into emergency preparedness and helping your community as I possibly can. And that's why I wanted to go through my experiences of how I got to where I am now and how I got to where I'm able to help the community in the way I'm helping it today. Yes, sir. Here, I'm going to give you this microphone so that you can ask your question and I don't have to repeat it so my memory doesn't have to be perfect. 
Thank you. My question is this. If I'm already CERT certified and I become a CERT trainer, I don't need, I, I live in West Valley City, so I don't need West Valley su- approval to become a trainer. Is that correct? I become a trainer. Then once I do that, how do I go about going to West Valley and going, well, I'm a trainer now. How, how do I help you? Okay, that's a great question. Um, the short answer to it, there's a, James, there's, a, there's a gentleman that actually is coordinating all of the CERT classes through, the, through DEM. Uh, James Ray is his name. And they put together their train the trainer courses on, on a somewhat regular basis. If you go out to the U-Train website that you can get to, uh, if you got to the, the, to the DEM site and you, you start looking up training and you go out to the U-Train site, you can look up for, you can look up train the trainer for FEMA and it will show you when a class is being offered and you can sign up for that. Now, but here's the question though, is <clears throat> when I went through the train the trainer, I learned about two different things that were going on. One is if you've got a metropolitan area that has got a good emergency preparedness plan and they're actively managing it, they will be the ones that you can report to as a CERT volunteer and they can get you assigned in to any of the response teams that they're putting together. But there's also a concept that they recognize and they talk about in Train the Trainer that at the time I took the course, now granted this is a few years ago now, but they refer to it as catch and release. If they can train some people on some skills and simply turn them back into the community, they are going to be very happy that that knowledge is out there because what you're doing is you're learning a set of skills that you can provide in a specific, in a specific event occurs in order to help your community. So, um, it depends then on, on how you get the relationship built in order to be able to then actually do that training with one of the in-person sites. I know in Bountiful City now, because we're working, Bountiful City does basically all of Davis County, including we picked up training for people in Salt Lake County as well. Uh, once in a while, we'll get somebody up from there. But uh, we work with South Davis Metro Fire in order to do those courses, and we're actually able to put together a very extensive mock disaster out at the gun range that is used for, for the uh, Bountiful Police Department when we put that together as the last uh, test and exercise for that program. And so then what you have to do is you have to find then where you can, where your skills are wanted and helpful in order to actually do that training. And that's the, that's the other side of that once you finish that course. But you can find it out on U-Train. Other questions? I appreciate this. This is this is good good questions. Yes, sir. I'm going to get you the mic. Mine is not a question; it's a statement. We've talked about Salt Lake County and maybe a little bit about Provo and going north. On the other side of the mountains. We have a lot of people that have radio licenses. I live in Heber, and in the 1980s, we had two people anywhere in Heber, in in Wasatch County, that had a license, and neither of them did anything with it. Then we, we started making classes to get people into it. Now we're over a hundred people in Heber. About 10% of that actually is working. And also Summit County and Morgan County are also the, the, the three counties get together and, and work together and we get a lot happening on the back side of the mountains. I appreciate that. And I need to come visit you guys sometime. So you, you, you let me know when, when, when your meetings are and I will be there. <clears throat> um, that, it's interesting when he talks about the number of, of, uh, of hams um, and the ones that are active. Uh, I had a Michael Groves who was teaching himself Python language pulled out the UIL database and did some uh, 
some work for me, <laughs> a query on it. So in the state of Utah right now, there are approximately 20,150 licenses that are active. Interestingly enough, 47 of them are novice class licenses, which they stopped issuing back in 2000. Um, but those people have obviously renewed their novice license on a regular basis because they would have expired. Anyway, of that, about 70% are technician. The rest, 30%, are, are general advanced extra. Um, and so, and to your point, um, what I don't know is how many of them are actually active because I know there are a lot of hams that get a radio because they saw something or somebody said you ought to do that for emergency prep. They got their license, went through a course, got a radio, put it in a drawer, and that's where it sits, uh, which is unfortunate because they're missing out on a lot of fun. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, that's one of the things to get more people licensed, but to get those with a license actually active is, a, is another opportunity for outreach. That's one of, I'm a big fan of get on the air uh, during field day in order to help people get on the air that haven't been on the air before. And if I've got an opportunity uh, to go to a school, I mean, we, we just did uh, an exercise recently with the um, uh, Arissa's uh, saddle, or, uh, space shuttle uh, or uh, space station uh, contact through schools. And students that get involved with that are, are fascinated by it. They love it. It really gets them excited. But excitement pans or peters out quickly. You need to keep that excitement going. And that's where local ham organizations such as this one and others in the state can really do a lot to keep young people uh, energized about this as both a hobby and a community service. Other questions? Are, oh, you know, Marvin just pointed at his watch. I feel bad now. Um, <laughs> So, um, pardon? <laughs> That's very good. I will leave it at this point. If you've got any other questions or you want to follow up with me about anything, w7vq at arl.net. It will get to me. I will get back to you as quickly as I can. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. If you ever like me to come back again, that's your problem. I would be happy to, <laughs> uh, and uh, and would be more than happy to talk on on this subject or a related subject. And I will let you know if I get Bouvet in my logbook. So, with that, I will turn the time back over to Marvin. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Rick. Is this on? I didn't turn it off. Okay, then it must be. Two excellent, very excellent uh, presentations, and I appreciate it from both of you. Has everybody got their ticket in here? While they're coming down there, I'll tell you a quick little story. This last week, uh, I have my, sh my shack in the basement of my house, but I operate it from my office because everything is networked. And uh, my office is getting a little crowded, so I decided to swap my office with my bedroom because the bedroom was larger. So I started swapping things back and forth, but uh, it just wasn't quite fitting the way I thought it was. So I figured I better stop and actually measure the rooms. One of the rooms was 10 by 12 and the other was 12 by 10. <laughs> Linda, you get a whole package of screwdrivers. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Anything else? If not, see you next month.